Philip Roth was not only considered the finest American Jewish writer, he was considered the finest living American writer for the last five or ten years of his life. He's funny, he's, his plots are great, he's uh, thoughtful. And we're going to look at some works uh, today and then three more times over the course of the mood, some works that he wrote when he was 24 years old. And Philip Roth wrote his entire life, his last work, uh, this one was from 1958. His last work was 2011. The length of his career is significantly longer than that of Shakespeare, and his works were consistently good. That's just unheard of in literature, to write for that long, but not just to write for that long, but to write great for that long. And the short stories that we're going to uh, look at are very frequently anthologized. If you were to grab an anthology of American short stories, I would put money that one of the short stories is one of the five, really one of the, the four that are good in the books that you have in front of you. Um, it's just considered among the finest of American literature, not just American Jewish literature. And a lot of what he talks about are themes of identity which for a mood session, uh, it really works nicely because identity is something that is central to, um, to the experience of being a modern Jew. Now, one of the neatest things about Philip Roth, especially early Philip Roth, which is what we're looking at, is that his symbols and his imagery and his meanings are on the surface. You don't have to dig deep. You don't have to be a graduate student or a professor of literature to find really, really interesting stuff going on in Philip Roth. So that's what we're going to do when we do uh, this together. Now, he's been criticized as, as having his symbols being too neat or too pat, um, not sophisticated enough, especially these early stories. But not everybody's a PhD in literature. So for us, and I think you'll see, it's going to be fun for us to look for some of these hidden meanings. And I accept that some of the ones I found are probably a stretch. I like to stretch looking for meaning in Philip Roth, but I think you'll see that a lot of them are there. I believe that almost all the images he use, uses are, his choices are deliberate. This story is, is important in part and we'll talk about it because this is the first time Roth was accused of being a self-hating Jew. So one of the things that we're going to be looking at is, is this a self-hating story? We're going to look at this excerpt uh, where Nathan Marks, who is a sergeant who is completely assimilated, goes to Friday night services. And these are Friday night services that the uh, Jewish privates went to him and said, we don't want to clean the barracks, which happens on Friday nights. We don't want to clean the barracks because we have to go to services. Will you give us permission? And he said, well, you have permission. And they said, but please make it official because otherwise the guys will, you know, they'll get on our case. And so he had the, uh, uh, somebody come and say, the captain has ordered Jewish personnel to go to services. And so he thought about it, and then you'll see what he says. But, now one night noise, one rumor of home in time past, and memory plunged down through all I had <clears throat> anesthetized, and came, and no, no, he's active. It's not that his Judaism ran away. He anesthetized it, and came to what I suddenly remembered was myself. So it was not altogether curious that in search of more time, I found myself following Grossbart's tracks to chapel number three, where the Jewish services were being held. I took a seat in the last row, which was empty. Two rows in front sat in front uh, uh, sat Grossbart. Um, of me sat Grossbart, Fishbein, and Halpern, holding little white Dixie cups. Now these three. Privates represent different kinds of American Jews, and you'll see. And I don't mean Reform conservative, but Orthodox, you'll see what I mean. Okay. <coughs> Each row of okay, uh, right. Each row of seats was raised higher than the one in front of this of it, and I could see clearly what was going on. Fishbein was pouring the contents of his cup into gross parts, 
And Grossbart looked mirthful. He's the, he's the soldier. Uh, Grossbart is the one who's really getting on Marx's nerves and saying, give us extra privileges, treat us special, because you're Jewish and we're Jewish. Uh, mirthful as the liquid made a purple arc between Fishbein's hand and his. In the glaring yellow light, I saw the chaplain standing on a platform at the front. He was chanting the first line of the responsive reading. Grossbart's prayer book remained closed on his lap. He was swishing the cup around. Only a helper responded to the chant by praying. The fingers of his right hand were spread wide across the cover of his open book. What does that mean? What does it mean if his fingers, if he's praying, and his fingers are spread over the cover of the prayer book? He's praying. Here's a prayer book, and he's praying. What does this mean? He knows the words. He knows the words. He's memorized it. Okay. So he's he's a rather religious Jew, right? Um, then uh, looking at uh, uh, okay, so that's Halper. Um, his cap was pulled down low into his brow, which made it round like a yarmulke. So he's trying to make it as much like shul as he can. From from time to time, Grossbart wet his lips at the cup's edge. Fishbein, his long yellow face a dying light bulb. So that's not a sense of somebody who's all that religious. Looks from here to there, craning forward to catch sight of the faces down into the row. He wants to see who's there. Um, uh, then, to those in front of him, then behind, he saw me, the sergeant, and his eyelids beat a tattoo. Now, a tattoo is a military uh, drum beat. But what else does a tattoo? Okay, so let's, let's start with the shot, the word tattoo. So, with him beating a military drum beat, why would he do that when he sees, there could be a couple of reasons. He sees the sergeant that gave him permission to came, come to services that he didn't think would come. Why would he do that? A military drumbeat. <clears throat> nervous? Okay, he's happy. Good. He's nervous. Maybe he's trying to get the attention of the other, right? Come on, guys, look, look. There's our right? There's our sergeant. His elbow slid into Grossbart's side, his neck then climbed towards his friend. He whispered something, and then, when the congregation next responded to the chant, Grossbart's voice was among the others. Fishbein looked into his book now. Why? Sergeant's watching. Sergeant's watching, right? Uh, and his lips, however, didn't move. Maybe he doesn't know the words. Finally, it was time to drink the wine. The chaplain smiled down at them as Grossbart swigged his in one long gulp. Halpern sipped, meditating, and Fishbein faked devotion with an empty cup. Three completely different attitudes towards being in show. Grossbart is really only in it for show. Halpern is religious, and Fishbein is completely a fish out of water. Why is it funny that I said he's a completely a fish out of water? What is the Yiddish word or the German word bind? means leg. So a fish with legs would be a fish out of water. <laughs> Philip Roth is giving us a story where there's a fish bind in Shul who's completely out of water. And names in Philip Roth are, are very often symbolic of something. As a matter of fact, Grossbart means a big beard. And I'm not sure exactly what that is. It, I don't think it means he's like an Eastern European from Jew, but it may be that it hides his face, that he's a kind of person who has a big beard that hides his face. Um, I don't know. Anything that jumps out from this section that you think is interesting or that you don't understand? I'm looking for the significance in the name of Halpern. Mm. You can't find one. No, you don't find one. Okay. I don't either. <laughs> uh, how about Marx? How about Marx? Do you see significance in Marx? Because in the story, the privates go to him and say, you know, we don't know for sure, but how do you spell your name? He's like, Marx with an X. Because that's how Karl Marx spelled it and how the Marx brothers, how Groucho spelled it. So we kind of assume that you were, uh, they didn't want to say Jewish. But then, they said, um, so, you know, can we get your permission to go to the Jewish services? And he said, look, either you clean the barracks or you can go to shul. 
And they say, you mean church, right? He says, no, I mean shul, get out of here. And then Philip Roth says, so then they realized that just like Harpo and you know, just like Groucho and uh, Carl, I was one of them. So, uh, it, and one thing we won't go over now, but is Nathan Marx a little bit like Karl Marx and a little bit about Groucho? That would be an interesting conversation. The other thing is, I've got relatives in St. Louis, and they said they'll give me a whole Passover dinner if I can get down there. God, Sergeant, that would mean an awful lot to me. No passes during basic, gross box. But we're off from now till Monday morning, Sergeant. I could leave the post, and no one would even know. I know, you know. But that's all, just the two of us. Last night I called my aunt, and you should have heard her. Come, come, she said. I got gefilte fish, chen, the whole works. Chen is, uh, is horseradish. The whole works. Just a day, Sergeant. I'd take the blame if anything happened. The captain isn't here to sign the card. You could sign. Look. Gross Sergeant, for you're very good at this. Sergeant, for two months practically, I've been eating trafe till I want to die. Now, before we go on, I have to tell you that he had had his father, who doesn't speak English, who only speaks Yiddish, a letter from his father to the congressman said, my son is in basic training and he can't eat the food. And so it became clear to Marx very quickly that Grossport had written the letter and his father had signed it. And then um, the, uh, uh, the captain got angry about it and said, uh, you know, what's the problem? We don't feed the troops. And Mark says, well, you know, his parents are very worried about him. And um, eventually, um, there's another letter to the congressman that says, my son has decided to just swallow his pride and eat the food. And I want to let you know there is a, a member of the personnel at the base who really deserves credit for this, and that's Sergeant Nathan Marks. And he really should be celebrated and given a commendation for this. So look at this. Um, so you can say, look, Rice Parts. Uh, then he says, Sergeant, for two months practically, I've been eating trade till I want to die. I thought you'd made up your mind to live with it. Minus a little bit of heritage. Now that's a direct quote from that second letter. Okay. Uh, he, he, um, he pointed a finger at me. You? That was, he said, that wasn't for you to read. I read it. So what? That letter was addressed to a congressman. Grossbart, don't feed me any baloney. Wanted me to read it. Why are you persecuting me, Sergeant? Turn it over. Are you kidding? I ran into this before, he said, but never from my own. Get out of here, Grossbart. Get the hell out of my sight. He did not move. Ashamed, that's what you are, he said. So you take it out of the rest of us. They say Hitler himself was half a Jew. Hearing you, I wouldn't doubt it. What are you trying to do with me, Grossbart? I asked him. What are you after? You want me to give you special privileges to change the food, to find out about your orders, to give you weekend passes. To find out about your orders, the idea is, are they going to fight in the Pacific or are they going to stay? And Grossbart keeps asking. You even talk like a goy! Grossbart shook his fist. Is this a weekend, just a weekend pass I'm asking for? Is a Seder sacred or not? Now there's something subtle here, th here that I didn't notice. I want to see if any of you notice about you even talk like a goy. It wasn't until I did a lot of reading about this story that a couple of people interpreted that, that phrase a specific way. What might be interesting or ironic about you even talk like a goy? All right, I'll give you a hint. What are you trying to do with me, girls, Park? I asked him. What are you after? You want me to give you special privileges, to change the food, to find out your, your orders, to give you weekend passes. That's very Jewish intonation. Exactly, exactly. And I didn't notice it, probably because I didn't listen to it. But he talks like a Jew. And then he's accused of talking like a goy. Um, so, uh, 
a Seder. It suddenly occurred to me that Passover had been celebrated weeks before I said so. That's right, he replied. Who says no? A month ago, and I was in the field eating hash. And now all I ask is a simple favor. A Jewish boy, I thought, would understand. My aunt's willing to go out of her way to make a Seder a month later. He turned to go, mumbling. Come back here, I called. I called. He stopped and looked at me. Rose Bart, why can't you be like the rest? Why do you have to stick out like a sore thumb? Because I'm a Jew, Sergeant. I am different. Better, maybe not, but different. This is a war, Rose Bart. For the time being, be the same. I refuse! What? I refuse! I can't stop beating me! That's all there is to it! Tears came to his eyes. It's a hard thing to be a Jew, but now I understand what Mickey says. It's a harder thing to stay one. Mickey is Mickey Halpern. Remember Halpern? He's the one with the yarmulke. Okay. It's a harder thing to stay one. He raised a hand sadly towards me. Look at you. Then you go. Stop crying. Stop this, stop that, stop the other thing. You stop, Sergeant. Stop closing your heart to your own. And wiping his face with his sleeve, he ran out the door. The least we could do for each other. The least. Okay, first thing, what is your name? Vivian. Vivian, extraordinary. I could not, could not have picked a better reader. Okay, what are your reactions to this, uh, this exchange? It's very quick fire. Quick fire, good. Well, he's trying to guilt him. Guilt, guilt right, black male emotional, 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 emotional black, black. good, good, exactly. He's trying to, mostly blackmail him, he's trying to, um, you know, Hitler was half a Jew, could there be any more extreme insult than that? Um, actually, in these short stories, it comes up a few times uh, that the characters in the stories criticize Jews as, uh, victims of the Holocaust uh, as being a little, some, it's their own fault. That shows up uh, here and there, and that's a little bit here, the idea that Hitler was, Hitler was half a Jew. But yeah, so this is a rapid fire exchange. It's very angry. And then soon thereafter, uh, gross parts away, and Nathan Marks starts thinking this. And Vivian, because this is all in his voice, will you do? Excerpt C. Who was I to have been feeling so grudging, so tight-hearted? After all, I wasn't being asked to move the world. Had I a right then, or a reason to clamp down on gross part, <coughs> when that meant clamping down on Halpern too, and Fishby, that ugly, agreeable soul? Out of the many recollections of my childhood that had tumbled over me these past few days, I heard my grandmother's voice. Okay, so before we hear the grandmother, what does that mean that Fishbein, the one who was totally out of water in the services, was an ugly, agreeable soul? That's a weird phrase. I don't have an answer, but I want to hear what you think. What? What does it mean to be an ugly, agreeable soul? Maybe he's seeing himself vulnerable and not liking what he sees, but also feeling sympathy because that's how he is. Excellent, excellent. I hadn't thought of it that way. Okay, so it's ugly because it's a mirror. Wow, I don't like what I see, but it's agreeable because, gosh, that's how I am. Excellent, I like that. Okay, now, please, give us his grandmother. What are you making? A sinners? Mm -hmm. It was what she would ask my mother when, say, I had cut myself while doing something I shouldn't have done and her daughter was busy bawling me out. I needed a hug and a kiss and my mother should mor would moralize. But my grandmother knew mercy overrides justice. I should have known it too. Who was Nathan Marks to be such a petty picture with kindness? Surely, I thought, the Messiah of himself, if he should ever come, 
won't niggle over nickels and dimes. God willing, he'll hug and kiss. Okay, excellent. Now, um, some interesting things going on here. First of all, just to put the setting, he's starting to regret saying no. Obviously, he's starting to regret saying no about the Seder. That's the background. Now, at Simmis, literally, it's like a little carrot stew or something, right? Maybe some little raisins. But um, he's saying that what she means when she says, what are you making at Simmis, is she's like overruling the mother, saying to the mother, come on, he's a kid, give him what he wants. So he's saying to himself, in his grandmother's voice, oh, why am I being at Simmons? The Messiah wouldn't treat people this way. So wow, this completely assimilated Jew is not only remembering his grandmother, he's got the Messiah's voice in his head, right? This, what I'm calling the Jew who did not know how to ask, is very quickly learning how to ask. This is how the story ends. What Nathan Marks does is kind of, uh, he kind of gets his revenge, all right? So Sheldon, and first of all, remember Sheldon said, I won't tell anybody. And then he comes back with the other two privates, and he says, can they come with me? And Mark's like, you said you weren't going to tell anybody. And he's like, oh, but they really need a Seder. Can they please come to the Seder, please, please, please? And we'll bring you some, some gefilte fish. And... Uh, Sergeant Marks says, uh, he says, okay, fine, just get out of there. I don't want to see you. Go bring me some gefilte fish. So they come back from the Seder, and they give him an egg roll. And he says, well, why are you giving me an egg roll? And they say, well, turns out I read the, the letter wrong. It's supposed to be next week. So we went to a Chinese restaurant instead. And Marx is angry and yells at him and kicks him out. And, he's, uh, uh, and then he actually takes the egg roll, egg roll and throws it out the window. And the story says that the next day, somebody uh, <coughs> finds the egg roll and says, it's Chinese freaking egg roll, which you would not find right on a military base. There really were, were three moments where Grosspart, really four, where Grosspart came and said, special privileges. You know, you're Jewish, we're Jewish, give me special privileges. The first was, we want to go to show instead of taking the barracks. And he won that one. The second was, I can't eat the food. And, and, he, and he would do these things like, well, it's not me, it's uh, Halpern, Hap, uh, uh, um, Halpern can't handle it, he throws up, please, 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 let us, and uh, Mark says no, and he writes the congressman, and it's this whole um, argument, and then finally, Grossbart backs off and gives credit to Sergeant Marx, which only annoys him more. The third thing is let us go to a Seder, and we talked about what happened there, and the fourth thing is please tell me, are we going to the Pacific? Or are we going to stay stateside? Because this is the uh, fighting in Europe is over. Uh, Marx was a decorated soldier in Europe, but he, they relocated him to this uh, camp in Missouri. And the privates wanted to know are we going to the Pacific, where obviously <coughs> we could die. And uh, Marx actually finds out that yes, they're going to the Pacific. And so uh, Shelton asks him again, are we going to the Pacific? And he says, kind of meanly, kind of schadenfreude, yes, you're going to the Pacific. Remember that, um, that Grosspart is a schemer. That's the whole story. He's always using, we were saying guilt, or what was the word we said for it? Uh, blackmail, right? And blackmail is very good here. He's a schemer, he gets what he wants. And so on this fourth one, where he's trying to use his Judaism, he knows he's not going to get it through Marx, because after the whole Seder debacle, he can't keep going with that. So he goes to Shulman, who also works in the army, and um, he pulls some strings there. And then, uh, after he tells, after Marx says to Grossbart, hey, everybody's going to the Pacific, he gets the list 
of who's going where. And Gross Bart is going to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, which is near New York City. So obviously he had pulled a string, and Mark says, but I wasn't it. I wasn't the string. I wasn't the string, right? Um, so, uh, so he gets his revenge. That's what Stu was referring to. He gets his revenge. And he calls the people in charge of who's going where. And he says, you know, I have this Jewish uh, private who was, uh, he's supposed to be sent to New Jersey. And he's really, um, he really wants to go to the Pacific because his brother died fighting the Nazis and he wants to kick the hell out of the Japanese. Would you please do me this favor and do him this favor? and send him to the Pacific instead, and just take another, take the first name of the alphabet and send him to New Jersey. They, want, they needed somebody with infantry experience. So when the final list camp comes out, the first guy in the alphabet is going to New Jersey, and Gross Bart is going to the Pacific. So Bob Wright answered the phone. How are you, Nate? How's the pitching arm? Good, Bob. I wonder if you could do me a favor. I heard clearly my own words, and they so reminded me of Gross Bart. Why does it remind him of Gross Bart? Now it's he who's doing the manipulation. Good. Um, that I dropped more easily than I could have imagined into what I had planned. This may sound crazy, Bob, but I've got a, a kid here on orders to Monmouth, New Jersey, uh, who wants them changed. He want, had a brother killed in Europe, but he's got hot to go to the Pacific. Um, says he'd feel like a coward if he winded up stateside. I don't know, Bob. Can anything be done? Put somebody else in the monument slot. <coughs> Who? He asked occasionally. Anybody. First guy in the alphabet. I don't care. The kid just asked if something could be done. What's his name? <coughs> Grossbart Sheldon. Wright didn't answer. Yeah, I said. He's a Jewish kid. So he thought I could help him out. You know. <laughs> so here we have. I'm Jewish. He's Jewish. Right? So this, like I like to call him the son who didn't know how to ask me. He's very quickly identifying with the Jewish community. And why is he identifying the Jewish community? Who can we, who can we connect that to? Why is he? Because of Gross Bart, right? So this experience of these Jewish privates, and especially this finagling, um, scheming one, is really making uh, uh, Marx look in the mirror. Um, uh, I guess I can do something, he finally said. The major hasn't been around here for weeks. Temporary duty to the golf cart. Golf course. I'll try, Nate. That's all I can say. I appreciate it, Bob. See you Sunday. And I hung up, perspiring. So he is not sure about what he's doing, right? He feels good about it, but he feels bad about it, which you'll see uh, when we get to the end. Uh, the following day, the corrected orders appeared. Fishbein, Buscelli, Filipovitz, Linky. Gromke, Grossbart, Gukwa, Halpern, Hardy. Lucky Private Harley Elton was to go to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, where, for some reason or other, they wanted an enlisted man with infantry training. After chow that night, I stepped back to the orderly room to straighten out the guard to the roster. Grossbart was waiting for me. He spoke first. You son of a bitch! I sat down at my desk. And while he glared at me, I began to make the necessary alterations in the duty roster. What do you have against me, he cried, against my family? Would it kill you to be, for me to be near my father? God knows how many months he had left to him. Why so? His heart, Grossbart said. He hasn't had enough troubles in a lifetime. You've got to add to them. I curse the day I ever met you, Marx. Shulman, that's the one, that's the string that he had pulled, right? And what's the string, guy, the guy's name? Shulman. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Shulman told me what happened over there. There's no limit to your anti-Semitism, is there? The damage you've done here isn't enough. You have to make a special phone call. You really want me dead. I made the last few notations in the duty roster and got up to leave. So he's ignoring this. Outburst. Good night, Grossbart. You owe me an explanation. He stood in my path. Um, Sheldon, you're the one who owes explanations. 
He scowled. To you? To me, I think so, yes. Mostly to Fishbein and Halper. What, what does he mean? He was, he was going to go to Monmouth, and uh, the two of them were going to go to the Right, so he's been pulling strings for, they get to go to Shoal, they get there, he tried to get them kosher food, and he got them to go to the Seder. And this string, he was only thinking about himself. Exactly. Exactly. Um, that's right, twist things around. I owe nobody nothing. I've done all I could for them. Now I think I've got the right to watch out for myself. For each other, we have to learn to watch out, Sheldon. You told me yourself. <laughs> right? So he's taking Sheldon's words and Sheldon's attitude from before, which is Jews have to look out for each other, and he's saying, you're not doing what you said you were going to do. Um, you call this watching out for me, what you did? Um, uh, uh, no, for all of us. Okay. Now, when Mark says for all of us, is he talking about the army or the Jews? For the Jews, uh -huh. you know, we have to, you know, if we're seen as always just being in our own interest, we won't be accepted in America. But who's going to know that Grossbart pulled this string? Somebody make, it, somebody make a case that it's for America, and then we'll come back and we'll look at it. Can somebody say why he might mean that he's looking out for all of us, for the whole army, for all America? Even if you don't agree, make a case. Well, he's speaking out against a kind of corruption that yeah. Grossbart had used to uh, influence uh, in a way that he shouldn't have done to change uh, where he was being posted. Right. It's not fair. And uh, ultimately, winning the war is the most important thing, including to the Jewish community. Right? We've already won in Europe, but it's not good for the Jews if the Japanese win the war. So, for all of us. Then, in terms of for the Jewish community, He's talking, it's still a little confusing, but uh, any comments on why he might mean the Jews? For all of us. He is watching out for all the Jews, or at least for all the Jews on the base. Show them their duty. Right, right. Okay, she said similar to you, that to show that they're doing their duty, but that might be internally, so that we all feel that we're 100% American. Uh, this comes right after uh, the 30s in America. In the United States, uh, the worst decade for Jews was the 1930s. Uh, uh, more anti-Semitism, more exclusion, uh, more uh, official hatred of the Jews, and World War II sort of brought <coughs> Judaism out of that. But there's already this sort of uh, nervousness, and he says so for all of us. I pushed him aside and started for the door. I heard his furious breathing behind me. And it sounded like steam rushing from an engine of terrible strength. You'll be all right, I said from the door. And I thought, so would Fishbein and Halper, and I'll be all right. Even in the Pacific, if only Grossbart continued to see in the obsequiousness of the one. Which one? Who's the obsequiousness? Fishbein. And the soft spirituality of the other, Halper, some profit for himself. I stood outside the order of the room, and this, this, this is the crux of the short story, as last paragraphs often are. I stood outside the order of the room, and I heard Grossbart weeping behind me. Over in the barracks, in the lighted windows, I could see the boys in their t-shirts, sitting on their bunks, talking about their orders as if they'd been, as they'd been doing for the last two days. With a kind of quiet nervousness, they published shoes, shine belt buckles, squared away underwear, trying as best they could to accept their fate. Behind me, Grossbart swallowed hard. Uh, when's the other time he swallowed in the story, Grossbart? With the wine. In short, he gulped it down. So here he is again, swallowed hard, accepting his fate, and then resisting with all my will an impulse to turn and seek pardon for my vindictiveness, I accepted my own. It's a little bit of a confusing sentence, so let's unpack it. First of all, who does he have an impulse for seeking pardon from? Or two, two possibilities, exactly. 
So, he, and, and if it's God, then wow, he's a different kind of Jew at the end of the story, but often seeking pardon. And, but it could be Fishbein, and he was vindictive, but he might, he might owe it to God to say, you know what, I treated one of, your, one of my fellow Jews, and I'm sorry about that. Or he may feel like he was unfair to gross part, so he had this impulse, and then he accepted my own, my own fate. What does that mean? What does it mean he accepted his own fate? Now, I'll, I'll just tell you what, it's, what we're not going to discuss, which is many interpreters of this paragraph have said, well, it could mean his fate that he's being sent to the Pacific as well. That's far too packed. It, I think that's a boring answer. And it's not part of the, it's not part of the story. That he's also going to the Pacific? Yeah. yeah, it doesn't work. So what does he mean he accepted his fate? Yes. That he has to live with the guilt of maybe if Gross Bart dies. You know, he that he's responsible for it. Good, let's go a step further. He has to become more Jewish again. Good. That's and that means living with guilt, with a sense of guilt. Well, <laughs> the Jews, are, the Jews are, are very much into guilt, and I get that. But faith, destiny, the destiny of the Jewish people is now his, which he couldn't accept until he's gone through this whole experience with the privates and especially with Gross Bart. Here he's accepted his guilt. So I have some interesting questions. First of all, first of all, is this a self-hating story? Because people said it's got this terrible image of a terrible person. Uh, as a matter of fact, somebody wrote a letter to the editor saying uh, Roth is an anti-Semite. In the Middle Ages, Jews would have known what to do with him. I haven't yet got any understanding of where the self-hatred comes in. Well, but if gross part isn't admirable, yeah. then Roth is airing our dirty laundry in public. As a matter of fact, he was speaking on a panel, and somebody raised their hand after the panel, or during, during the question and answer, and said, Roth, would you have written this story in Nazi Germany? Okay, here's the question. Who, who is the defender of the faith? Seems like there are two possibilities, right? Gross Bart or Marx. So we're going to discuss it, but before we do, who thinks it's probably Gross Bart is the defender of the faith? Okay? And who thinks it's probably Marx? Okay, we're a couple in one direction and most in the other direction. Uh, there were two that said it's probably Gross Bart. Do you, one of you want to say why you thought that way? He's the one who's actually bringing it out. He's bringing it out to the other two. Yeah. Yeah, so he's the one. He's, although he's not especially religious. Yeah. He's the one who's standing for them, but standing for himself and yeah. selfishly. Yeah. But he is bringing the other two with him most of the time. Right, right. Although it's interesting, it's he's not even a defender. He's like an aggressor. In some ways, he's the aggressor of the faith. Who's he defending? Pushing away. Himself, himself, right. Himself, okay, so who thinks, that some, somebody, somebody who raised their hand that they think that Marx is the defender of the faith? In terms of, of Grosspart, Grosspart is doing whatever he can, and he's... Thank he's, you. He's not using Judaism as something positive for himself. He could care less <laughs> about shul, and he doesn't want to clean the barracks, and he wants ostensibly different food, because probably the standard food or whatever, and, uh, and going to a seder a month after or whatever it is, it's just, it's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> and um, Marx is doing whatever he could within that realm. But he now understands that he has to defend all of the Jews for the right reasons, not for gross parts wrongly. Which at the beginning wasn't even on his agenda. Okay, questions about the story or about Roth? Oh, yeah. No, that's a question. Yeah, I think that what Marx, yeah, Marx is the defender of the faith. Basically, you know, just. He's defending uh, Jewish people as a whole, as people who are loyal to America, who are uh, um, willing to play fair, and uh, if you know these favors eventually backfire because people say, "Oh, you Jews are only interested in yourselves." 
So you have to be, a, you know, like a model citizen. If, if, once you're known to be Jewish, you have an obligation to um, to act righteously and be the so, of the nation. So is there anybody in here who didn't read it and now wants to? Okay, good. I hope you will. Okay, thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. I travel to a lot of the moods, um, and I have a budget to do so. So if you wanted me to invite you, if you want to invite me to your event, let me know, and uh, uh, you don't have to pay for my transportation. Um, and finally, um, I have a custom um, of not standing here and letting people come up and ask questions. And if you have questions, I want to talk to you. I always go to the door and thank people as they leave. So I'm going to do that. If you don't mind filling out the survey, that would be great. Feel free to take books. I'll clean up afterwards. I'm going to go to the back. Thanks for coming, everybody.